Capture the passion. Welcome back to CPTP Season 3, Episode 3. Today we have a very special guest, Professor Kay Manning. And she's going to talk to us about East LA College, where she teaches practicum, child development. Uh, tell us about yourself, Kay. Oh, well, I'm really glad to be here. And um, I, I'm excited to talk about East LA College because I started there. So when I started East LA College, I, was, um, I thought I was going to be one of the oldest people. Actually, I was 22, but I already had a child. So I was really scared to go, but I'm so glad I did. And I, it took me seven years to get through um, ELAC because I had children, and I worked, and I had trouble getting a babysitter. So, um, so my heart is really with that college and mm -hmm. how much it supported me and helped me. And I'm just happy to be teaching there. And currently, I'm teaching the practicum class, mm -hmm. which is CD22. And that is where the students have hands-on experience mm -hmm. with real children. So um, they go into the classrooms. Luckily, we can do that now because it's post-COVID. And um, they have they prepare activities, and they read stories, and they do finger plays, and just start to become a, a, mm -hmm. a regular teacher. So it's an exciting time for us and, and for them as well. So that's sort of like the student teaching course, right, at the community college level? It's pretty much exactly like when I did student teaching mm -hmm. for my credential. Okay. Yeah. How many hours do they have to do? So they have to do... Um, about well, we 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 can we have to do ninety, mm. but they also have to do professional development. Oh, okay. So it's one hundred and eight total. And in the in that classroom, it's a semester long at uh, East LA College. Um, what what are some of the topics? Or what does it consist of? So it it's about we have some curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, we have some um, really important really important to us is um, child teacher interaction Ooh, okay. because this may be the only place they're really getting that. Yeah. As they go on, um, I don't know how much they talk about it in the, when they transfer. So to us, that's kind of the heart mm -hmm. of um, the quality of education that we're trying to build for our students and our, and our, our future teachers and our students. Right, and, and I think it's important to talk about that, talk about the adult-child interaction. I think, um, like you said, it's really not talked about much, and although that is probably the most important element in a, in a preschool classroom, any classroom for, um, for that matter, how children can connect with the teachers and how the teachers connect with the children. Um, so what approach do you use? Well, a little bit different than some people think, I think, because a lot of people think, oh, I'm reading a story, I'm interacting with the children. Mm -hmm. Or I'm asking questions on the rug and they're sitting there, I'm interacting with children. But we're really encouraging what we call small group activity or small group um, situations where we can interact one to one with mm -hmm. the child. And that's when you can really build rapport. Right. And and they really begin to trust you. And, um, you know, it, it's a little different because they may begin to share things that they wouldn't share if you're just sitting in front of the group. Right, reading right. Reading a story. So you have to be, um, you know, you have to be careful, respectful, um, keep things confidential sometimes, right. and, and report if you have to, too. Yeah, and, and you know what, what's interesting? In the previous two episodes uh, this season so far, we've talked about uh, social-emotional development. And we talked about the importance of children having a sense of belonging um, with the adult, the caregiver, in this case, the teacher at school. In, in your opinion, how important is that for academic success? Yeah, it's probably number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> number one for me. I, I was sharing with you earlier that I, I also have a degree in um, family counseling, child right. and family counseling. And so I, I realized after studying that as well that if they have the social emotional in place, mm -hmm. they have they have options to, to share and, and to um, feel good about themselves and, um, you know, not feel horrible that they, they have these burdens and things, that it makes their academic, their um, academics come so much easier. Right. You know, interesting, not planned, but I'm glad that we're having this conversation that in the first two episodes and now in the third one today, uh, we're talking about the importance of emotions and the importance of allowing young children to be able to have these conversations about their emotions. Um, in in your, the classroom that you teach, uh, the practicum, is there a specific component that you use to focus on social and emotional development? Yeah, one of the things that, um, and I work with a team of um, CD 22 and 23 professors where we're all kind of... Name drop, please, name drop oh, name them. Drop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so I work with um, Carolyn Jin, and um, Mar Maribel Soriano, and Anna Reese, and Tony Newman, and um, 
thinking uh, Maya Castro, and so we um, we we work together and we meet regularly because that's one of the things that we're flushing out that we're right. trying to get more connection with the students to social social emotional because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not something that's really addressed in the textbooks. Textbooks tend to f focus more on social and how to get kids to interact with each other and <clears throat> you know how to play and not you know to share and things like that, but. What we really need to help our students with is how to how to deal with emotions, and a lot of times right. that's hard because they are still learning that how to deal with their own emotions. Yeah. So it, it's like a, a sword kind of. Thing. Yeah, and, and w when you inject culture into that, into culture is just not talking about emotions. And, and my example that I've given in the previous two episodes is um, I grew up in a very traditional Mexican um, household where, as as a guy, there's eight of us. And being the second oldest of the men, there's three men and five girls. Um, it was perfectly fine for my sisters to cry, to be upset, to feel sad. But for us, the three boys, it was kind of frowned upon if we showed any other emotion aside from being angry. Being angry was perfectly fine. But if we showed us a sign of sadness and we were weak or our masculinity was uh, challenged, um, it's so critical to have that conversation with children, giving them a safe environment to talk about their emotions. How, how is that um, taken by students to now start having conversation with children about their emotions? I think it's really eye-opening because a lot of students do share, mm -hmm. and we do some things in, in discussions now that we're on Canvas and mm -hmm. sometimes in person, um, where a lot of them have the same feelings that you do, right. or not, I mean, the same experiences that you mm -hmm. do, where they're not allowed to really talk about their emotions, and, and as, as a woman, um, I grew up with three brothers, I could cry all I wanted, but I, I wasn't supposed to show anger, right. so it was like, and my mom said to me one time, well, you can't get angry, you're a girl, I'm like, but anger comes from fear and, and um, you know, frustration and hurt, mm -hmm. so of course I got angry, but I was, you know, I wasn't allowed to show it, so um, I think it's really helpful for them as well to realize it's okay to talk about your feelings and in a positive way and mm -hmm. how um, how therapeutic it can be. And sometimes I've noticed my students just sharing their experiences is so bonding mm -hmm. and it builds rapport in our classroom as a whole that we begin to connect. Right. And even as the instructor, I connect with my students so that we're starting to understand that that's such an important component of, of life and, and education. Right. Now, th there's a specific approach that you use in your classroom. Why don't you tell us about that approach? So one of the things that we've been, all of us really, um, all the professors have been looking into and, and studying a little bit more is just Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. So he had a TV program, and um, they recently made a documentary about him. Well, not, yeah, I guess recently. But um, some, of the, some of the quotes and things that he has have really enlightened us and really helped us to... Um, have something to share with the students mm -hmm. because he had such a different approach um, to talking with children. Mm -hmm. um, number one, he really listened, which a lot of times we don't. <laughs> we want to give children advice because we think we're older or whatever. He really listened to children. He got down on at their level, okay? And, and some of you that might remember Mr. Rogers, he used puppets, mm -hmm. and puppets can be kind of indirect, kind of a cushion, so children don't feel very confronted that way, so it's mm -hmm. a little softer, easier approach if you use puppets. And then um, just to really accept children as they were. So it um, didn't matter if they had a disability, it didn't matter um, you know, what, what kind of issues they had, he accepted all of them. Very, very loving, very, very kind approach. So I think that's so important. Yeah, and one of the things that you mentioned that's very critical is the listening part of it, right? A lot of the times I think that as, as parents, as teachers, as educators, we sort of we get this pressure as in, to oh, a child is, has a conflict, I need to have a solution, as opposed to letting them problem solve on their own <laughs> or just listening to them. Um, is there something within Mr. Rogers' approach that you probably use in your classroom that helps future teachers understand the listening component of it? Wow, I hadn't thought about that. Um, well, I do have them talk to each other, so right, we do yeah. little discussions, and we do, um, one of the things that we really focus on is open-ended questions. Oh, yes. So instead of saying, you know, what color is your shirt, you know, um, having them 
having the students develop and then share with each other and talk with each other open-ended questions so that they, they're listening to each other mm -hmm. and then they also feel what it feels like to be listened to. Right, and, that's, and I think that's being empathetic, that's right? Yeah. And, um, I remember it was my first year as a full-time teacher uh, working for a, a, a large district. And I remember I, I went to my leadership and I went above my administrator at that time and I said, hey, you know what? Um, I, can't, I can't get through Jorjito. Jorjito, he, he's fighting. He's very aggressive. He shows no remorse. He shows like if he has no care in the world, he just has a lot of anger. How can I teach empathy? And um, Manuel Caldera, who was uh, one of the local district um, directors, he, he gave me the best answer. And to this day, I still carry with me. He says, you can't teach this. You have to model it. Right. Yeah. And my modeling it is, okay, so now I have to put myself in a situation of behaving a certain way that demonstrates compassion, empathy, sympathy. But how do I do that if I don't even know what that looks like for myself? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? So I think it's very important, and I give uh, Elac and your team a lot of credit to take on this role into having a conversation of someone like Mr. Rogers and using the resources that he has to be able to educate future teachers to take on something that's really not talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. So how, how, do, how do you guys come up with um, your brainstorming to decide, okay, this is what we're going to use from his approach. We're going to use this approach to help them inject it into the classroom. What are, what are some things that you use? I think we're still learning. Yeah. I think we're still learning about Mr. Rogers and all of the, you know, he, there's a lot to take on with him. But... Um, I guess one of the things is, um, like, we, we, we have discussion groups among ourselves, mm -hmm. and we kind of brainstorm ideas, and then, um, then we, take it, we take it to our students. We do a lot of things together, so mm -hmm. we get feedback yeah. from each other. And then one of the things that's really, really important about Mr. Rogers is he would talk about subjects that weren't talked about, mm -hmm. you know. So he was, um, you know, he was talking about things on the air that people didn't mention for children. So such things as the assassination. So mm -hmm. when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, people don't tell children about that, you know. But he had a program and he brought it up. Mm -hmm. You know, he talked about the assassination. What does that mean if someone's assassinated? So he, he said if it's mentionable, it's it's doable. You know, mm -hmm. it's something that you can um, that you can talk about. And so um, so many topics. So he talked about race. Mm -hmm. I, there's wow. there's a part of um, one of the things that that he showed us was that he would do for kids, and this was actually in one of his early programs. And and here my son is watching, and I didn't realize it, but is in those days, and um, well, I'm I guess I'm talking like in the 60s, 70s, when they had um, so much race discrimination, and so if you were African American or black, you weren't allowed to sw swim in the public pools, and so. Um, one of the things he did on the air on the television was he there was a one of his characters was a police officer, and he invited him to share a tub of water. It was real hot, so they all they both took off their shoes and they both put their feet to cool them off in a pail of water in a bucket of water. And then, as the guy finished cooling off his feet, then he shared his towel with him. So that goes right mm. to the modeling, modeling that you're yeah. saying. He didn't say, oh, love everybody. He didn't say anything like that. Mm -hmm. He showed how to do it. He showed acceptance. He showed, I am sharing my towel mm -hmm. with this man, this black man, you know, and we're sharing the water. I mean, he just made it look like nothing was happening, right. nothing special. But, you know, that was huge, huge for children to see that. And um, so he, he touched on on areas that no one else would talk about. Mm -hmm. He talked about death, and he had a, a thing on his television show where the fish died, and so he actually dealt with the fish in the fish tank and fishing it out. You know, mm -hmm. the fish had died. He talked about um, illness. He had a little boy on his program that had um, that was in a wheelchair that had a lot of um, a lot of just problems with his physique, and um, he had him on there, and, and they sang a song mm -hmm. together. And, and so he addressed death and disease and illness and, um, you know, just tragedies yeah. that were happening with children, things like 9-11. Yeah. 
mm. um, you know, were, were things that he would talk about on yeah. the air with children, which a lot of my students, I'm realizing, are afraid to talk about with children. Yeah. So when we talk about social emotional, um, we have like taboo topics or tender topics that we're, that as adults, that we don't talk about with each other. And we definitely often don't talk about with children. So those are one of the, we're trying to open those doors. Yeah. Because children really, really need to know what's going on. Otherwise, it's way more scary. <laughs> let, let, let me ask you this, and I'm, I'm hearing you talk, and um, you triggered me when you, when you said about uh, death. And I shared with you, um, I lost my dad going on um, three years now. And one of the things that has been very difficult for me is dealing with the grief. And it's it's difficult because, again, growing up not being allowed to talk about sad, anything that made me sad, mm. and even just talking about it makes me feel sad. <laughs> but as an adult now, trying to find a way to have a meaningful conversation about grief or about anything, like you said, um, tender topics, it's such taboo because... It hasn't been normalized, but here you are, here you have someone like Mr. Rogers talking about expressing yourself, talking about topics that provoke emotion, provoke an outlet mm -hmm. of our emotions, which is the, I think, the gist of, of, of what you're talking about. Giving the children an opportunity to talk about their emotions instead of suppressing them. Yeah. Right? Um, analogy that I like to give my students is, think of a Coke bottle, and that's you. And every time you get shaken, what happens? And, and you gave me a, a different scenario earlier about the mm -hmm. balloon, right? Right. That Coke bottle continues to get shaken by experiences that we have in life. And then eventually, you open that Coke bottle with all that pressure. What happens? It explodes. As opposed to having an outlet to release that pressure in a healthy way, then you might not have that emotional um, meltdown. But... If we haven't been taught at a very young age how to let those emotions come out, then how are we going to be able to do that as an adult? The fact that you guys are doing that, it's, it's so gratifying to hear that that's one of the components you're using in, um, in the practicum class, which it's a requirement for um, community college students that want to be, that want to go into teaching to take, correct? Right. Um, I hear compassion in what you're talking about. I hear sympathy. I hear empathy. Empathy, yeah. I hear acceptance. I hear diversity, awareness of all that. You know, th these are things that you're doing through Mr. Rogers' approach that has been around for how long again? And mm -hmm. why is it, hasn't this been normalized? You know, and I, I'm, I am so surprised that it's all of a sudden there's a big surge in interest mm -hmm. in him. Right. And um, probably because of all the things our kids have been through right. with COVID and everything. But people are starting to say, oh, you know, he had some really important things to say. And we're, like I said, we're still learning um, how to, you know, absorb everything he's teaching. Yeah. And then how do we guide the students mm -hmm. to really understand that? And, um, and a lot of it is modeling. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is modeling. Yeah, and, and that modeling uh, approach that you're showing a resource that demonstrates that. And um, I think of social learning theory. Children learn based on what they see, the interactions that they see around them. And here you have a very valuable resource that's demonstrating that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's fascinating. Tell, tell us another um, approach that you use um, from Mr. Roger that you found to be very successful with your students. Oh, let me think. Another approach that I... I, don't know okay. if I can, like, give, us, give us some feedback. What have been some feedback from your students? That you said they've been receptive to it. What have been some feedback that they... Oh, um, okay. Well, the students um, often share after... We have some of the discussions, and um, even during COVID, we were able to do that on uh, in breakout rooms. Okay. And so one of the things we would do is sometimes have other students help. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we would combine, so the CD23 students, which is the higher practicum class, more advanced practicum mm -hmm. class. Second part. Second part. Um, would facilitate the CD22 students, and they would kind of ask these questions and guide them. And so it was almost like, therapy you know it was mm -hmm. just like people were saying this is how I was raised and I was raised like that well I was raised like that and so they were able to share mm -hmm. and then start to see how can we make it different 
for our students? Mm -hmm. you know, how can we make it different for the children? And some of them cried. Yeah. You know, some of them cried when we finished the the discussions because they were so touched um, that they, their feelings were being accepted and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So I think they're starting to see that that's what we want to do for children. Right. And if, if you put it in perspective, you have college students that are feeling in a way of I'm being heard. I'm talking about my emotions. I'm letting these emotions come out. Mm -hmm. Are now getting an, a first-hand experience into what that feels like. And these are future teachers, right? Right. Now they have that experience. They're going to go into the classroom and have that opportunity to share that approach with young children. I mean, talk about long, how, how important is this for long-term success with children? Yeah, no, it's, it's going to really help. And, um, I mean, like you said, with academics, mm -hmm. because when, once they're grounded and they feel comfortable, yeah. then they're open. If you're going to school and you're all upset, you know, you're not hearing anything that anybody's saying. Right. And um, so, yeah, one of the things that I'm really, that we kind of talk about is modeling. Mm -hmm. And so even even though we don't want to go to school and say, oh, I'm, I'm crying because I just broke up with my boyfriend, you know, we're not going to do that probably in the classroom. <laughs> so we have to maintain professionalism. Right. But um, but to say, and I remember I used to read, I had a reading time, and, you know, I'd be reading a story, and the kids are, you know, I had 33 kids, and they're all glued to the book, and all of a sudden the phone would ring. And in those days, we didn't have cell phones, so they'd, I'd have to get have up. To get up yeah. <laughs> I would say to my class, oh, I'm so frustrated, you know. I'll be right back. And I'd go answer the phone because if it was the office, you had to answer the phone. And I'd come back. And one day, you know, after I did this a few weeks, um, one day the phone rang. My little class said, teacher, you're going to be frustrated. You know? <laughs> and so they're already getting the vocabulary. Yeah. And that's one of the things they don't have. Mm -hmm. So we, we say, if you're happy and you know it, if you're angry and you know it, we, we know those words. But that's about all that they're capable of expressing mm -hmm. is sadness, um, you know, if you're happy, you're sleepy, you're tired, you know, whatever. But we don't give them frustrated. We don't mm -hmm. give them a lot of alternate emotions or combined emotions mm -hmm. to express. Right. You know? And I really encourage every single preschool, elementary school, <laughs> whatever, to have a feelings chart in the classroom. Um, I just, I, I did counseling as well. And kids would come in and they would show you mm -hmm. and we'd label that. Okay, so they'd look at that face and they'd say, and they, one, one little boy came in one time and he went right over the chart and he said, teacher, and he pointed to the, the one that said embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And I was like touched by that. You know, I'm like, oh, tell me about that. You know, and he said, I didn't wear my uniform today. You know, and it was like, you could tell how he was feeling <laughs> and he would probably start acting out, mm -hmm. but because he expressed it, yeah. you accept it. And sometimes just say, tell more, tell me more, you know, then you're listening, you know, and that makes all the difference for them, you know. So I really think people should have feeling charts, and then, then we have to model what some of those feelings are. So I can say something embarrassed me, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. or something frustrated me, or it was hard, you know. I remember in the old days we'd have like a, a TV that we'd show videos on, and yeah. And sometimes somebody else checked it out when it was your turn. And I remember I would say, okay, you have to show children. That made me upset. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, it made me upset that we can't watch the video today. Yeah. I didn't scream or holler or cry or anything. But, you know, but I would I would model that. Mm -hmm. And so they would get that idea. Right. Oh, so when they feel frustrated, I mean, all of a sudden kids are saying that word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we have to model not just the feeling and how to accept it, but also the vocabulary. Yeah. Because the more vocabulary they have, the easier it is. And giving them that platform to articulate what they're feeling in a healthy way. Yes. Um, would eventually normalize feeling not just happy or, or angry, but everything else there in between. And like you said, um, when children have that sense of trust with you mm -hmm. and they feel secure with you, then they're more likely to, to do that. When, when children get upset, I've heard it many times, don't get upset. When children cry, don't cry. Right. It's like suppressing those the opposite. very important yeah. emotions as opposed to it's okay to cry. I remember one time, um, it was the beginning of the school year, uh, transitions was, was very difficult, and um, the administrator walked in and said, why is Jorjito crying? 
I said, well, Julito's crying because he wanted to be with his parents, you know. It's the first week of school. Is, oh, Julito, don't cry. No, don't cry. And it's like, what's wrong with crying? You know, why can we allow the children to show their emotions? Well, we don't want them to cry because we don't want them to be upset. That's still an emotion. You want them to just bottle it in, yeah. Right, yeah, just, just bot- bottle it in yeah. and don't ever talk about it again. But not understanding the long-term consequence of that can be very, very detrimental to his own um, mental health. Right. And, and what, it, what you're telling the child is, I don't accept your feelings. Right. Uh, yes. Thank I you. don't accept your feelings. So I, I had a transition tool that I used when I taught kindergarten because just about every child is scared to come to kindergarten, mm-hmm. whether they tell you or not. You know? so, I would, so if they were crying, I would say, oh, you have some strong feelings. Yeah. And I had a, I had, used to have a, like a chart, I mean, like a shelf. And so I would walk over and I'd say, I think we need to share this with your mom. If they had a mom, you know, whoever the guardian or parent was. I'd say, I think we need to tell your mom about this, right? Let's share your feelings. So I said, what, let's write her a letter. I'd say, what kind of, what color does your mom like? Pink or yellow? And they go, <laughs> pink. You know, yeah. Because you can't cry. You can't cry. Cognitively, you can't cry and talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they'd say pink, and I'd say, okay. So I get it out. These are kids that can't read or write yet. I'd say, okay, dear, and I'd spell it out, dear. What do you call your mom? Mommy. Okay, dear mommy. Okay. And then I'd say, I feel, and I'd say, what shall I tell her? And they said, sad, you know. And so they draw, I draw a circle. And and I'd say, do you want to draw the face, Mm -hmm. or do you want me to draw the face? Sometimes they would do it. What the little boy said to you, so he, I drew the two eyes and the nose and the mouth, the sad mouth. He took the marker and he went and drew like 50 tears. <laughs> tears he wanted her to see the tears. <laughs> and then I'd say, love. And then I'd say, do you want to write your name or do you want me to write your name? This child has stopped crying, right? Because they're engaged in sharing their feelings, but it's a different way to share them. Yeah. Every child in the class is watching. Every other child. And probably 90% of them are feeling exactly the right, same right. as that child feels. And so we'd put, you know, you know, Johnny or whatever. And then I'd say, do you want to put it in your backpack or your cubby? And we'd fold it up. And they'd show it to their parent. They never cried again. They never cried again. Now, I had a little boy that used to come in and say, can we write another note? <laughs> you know, because he was still feeling those feelings. But yeah. it gave them... It gave them um, An outlet an outlet, Mm -hmm. it gave them acceptance, but then the other children knew, oh, she accepts our feelings. It just, it it sounds like therapy. (laughs) That's what it sounds like. It sounds like, you you know, you're you're giving your kindergartens a therapeutic way to vent and express those emotions. And we accept it. And And one of the parents got upset. Well, one little boy said to me, I said, let's write your mom a note. And he said, okay, I hate school. So I wrote, I hate school. And he said, and I hate my teacher. So I wrote, and I hate my teacher. So I sent it home, and the mom came and said, why did you let him do that? And I said, because that's what he was feeling. Mm-hmm. You know? And I said, don't worry, you know, because he's sharing. He's scared. Mm-hmm. He's letting you know, I'm really right. distressed. This is what he said to me. It's okay. He's the same kid that comes in two days later and says, I love you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because now he knows I'm going to accept yeah. his feelings. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, let's... let's Let's um, dive into that conversation about emotions. And a lot of the times, we as teachers, we don't read into the children's feelings when in reality, that's a big cry for help. It's right. a red, it should be a red flag for us to say, ooh, okay, maybe Corjito needs a little bit more. Maybe I need to do a little bit more to understand what Corjito's feeling because there might be some underlying issues there that I'm just not seeing. As opposed to, Nah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't cry. Your mom and dad will pick you up later. You know, suppressing those emotions. So, in in your experience, um, how how do you help teachers identify some potential red flags when in regards to emotions? Like, you mean what kind of red flags do you mean? Um, as far as behavior, do you think children misbehave intentionally, or do you oh, think okay. do you yeah. think that the misbehavior can be an outlet for the child because that's all they know? They know that. You know, it's been normalized for me that when my when my parent gets upset, then they lash out, they curse, they fight, they throw things. So now as a child, I'm upset, but I don't know how to healthy 
release those emotions, I'm going to behave the way that I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to behave. Right, right, yeah. No, just about, I mean, as far as my experience with kids, and I was in the classroom for 35 years, um, I never met a bad child. Right. And I never met a child that, um, that didn't have a really good reason mm -hmm. for what they did. You know, once you figure it out, but you can't ask them why. Mm -hmm. And that's really, people don't understand that. That's, that's too, if I said, why are you here today? <laughs> you know, but that's usually the first question that's, that's asked. Ask, why, why are you doing this? And you're too, it's too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Because none of us can, why are you here today? You know, none of us can really answer that. It's too broad. And they're like, so they'll say either because, and you'll say, <laughs> because why? And they'll say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because they can't, they don't have, especially when you're dealing with preschool and kindergarten, you know, Piaget, they're still in pre-operational thought. Right. So until they're over seven or so, they, they don't have those concrete thoughts. Mm -hmm. So they honestly can't tell you the answer to that question because they don't have the, the cognitive ability to right. say that. So, but if you say, can you tell me about that? So I had something called the talking chair. It didn't talk, but I had a chair in my classroom <laughs> that, um, that, that's where we went to talk so that I'd always be at eye level with the children. Okay. So I teach my students this too. So that you want to be one to one, you know, want to be at eye level mm -hmm. because if you're, if you're in a power position, if you're standing over them, you don't have rapport with right. them. You're like, you know, right. but right. if you're, down with them so I'd have them here and if two kids were hitting I'd bring them both to the talking chair I'd put my arm on each shoulder mm -hmm. I don't know who's at fault I knew who hit but I don't know who's at fault I'm not making a judgment so I would physically support them mm -hmm. you know and I'd say I can see that that we're having a problem can you tell me about it and they would solve the problem he'd say well he hit me and then he'd say because he took they just start talking I mean they just solved the problem. Yeah. So it got to the point where I never had to go to the chair anymore. Mm -hmm. The kids would be fighting. They'd say, let's go to the talking chair. And they go to the talk. They would work it out mm -hmm. because they were listening to yeah. each other. And they were saying, what happened, you know? And so, um, but you have to say, tell me about it. Yeah. If you say, tell me about it, you know, mm -hmm. then then they can share what, what's important right. to them. And it's not so deep. <laughs> and then they're, they're, uh, I think when you're asking them, tell me about your feelings, it's easier for them to articulate that versus why, why, I don't know why I'm feeling angry. I don't know what, caused, I can't even think back to three seconds ago because I'm so infuriated with this emotion that I don't know how to properly vent. Yeah. Um, to, I, I find that to be very powerful um, that you're teaching this to future teachers and hopefully they can take these strategies to be able to apply in the classroom to be able to lead a whole different shift in society well, where it just it changes all your behavior problems is what it yeah, does it, it does it really does it really eliminates a lot of behavior problems. right right and then um what happens is too if you if you if you kind of say so he hit you anger comes from fear or hurt so mm -hmm. do you think he was hurt or do you think you know did something hurt his feelings or something scare him and then the other child will say oh because I told him you know whatever I mean they start to tune in to oh the reflection part the reflection yeah. part and these are three and four and five year olds mm -hmm. you know yeah. oh yeah that's completely doable and, and uh, it's it's something that children have the capacity to do as long as it's facilitated in that proper way they, they, they get it they get it they, they get understand it. it and a lot of times I think society just believes that oh they're too small they won't remember or no they don't understand no they do yeah they completely our uh, first guest dr judy cross talked about her brain is um developed 90 percent of its development takes effect in the first five years and she, she also mentioned the synapses the synapses are going to be connected and how you are facilitating that growth so if you're facilitating their growth to express those emotions in a healthy way then guess what those synapses are going to continue to to connect as they go on in their life. Um, I'm fascinated by the work that um, you're doing with the team and injecting uh, Mr. Rogers' approach with it because it's, it's valuable. It's so valuable. What are, what are some valuable points that your students have taken away from this approach? Well, I think some of it is they want to know more about him. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and there's so, many, um, there's so many things out there now mm -hmm. um, that they're, they're, they have a whole foundation. So... They have um, symposiums and they have mm -hmm. lectures and they have um, more literature and, mm -hmm. and they're 
a lot of his quotes and things like that. So some of my students, I can just see that they're hungry yeah. to learn more about, about what he had to offer. But I think a lot of it is that they just realized that, you know, he had problems too. Mm -hmm. So he was very ill as a child and spent a lot of time in bed and didn't have a very good self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And um, and then realizing how how you can start off and just have all these problems and it can generate into something so so beautiful, yeah. you know. So they, um, I, I think they get really interested mm -hmm. in in what he has to offer. Right. Yeah. And in your in your opinion, do you think by uh, injecting this approach uh, in in your class, do you think it should be taken into consideration for other colleges to follow um, to use this approach? Well, it certainly seems to be working for us. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> so, right? And there, there really isn't anything that I've seen out there, because I'm very tuned into mm -hmm. emotional um, support for kids and, and um, education and books mm -hmm. and things like that. There's nothing I really, there's like not really a tool mm -hmm. that, that we say, oh, you can learn about this and help right. your children emotionally. Usually when we categorize the domain, we say social-emotional, mm -hmm. and people tend to focus on the social aspect. Right. So right. they're talking about the child, you know, are they sharing? Are they able to share? Are mm -hmm. they able to take turns? Are they able to wait in line? Are they able to talk to other kids? But not so much about um, the feeling part right. and sharing, sharing and accepting other people's feelings. So that, now I want to ask for your um, professional experience uh, perspective, the question that I want to ask. Uh, do you think a lot of it has to do with just society not normalizing like, and I'm going to go on a limb and say mental health. Mental health has a lot to do with our emotions. Do you think that that's why um, we don't have toolkits out there or we don't have solid curriculums? Now, I'm not saying that there isn't any, but solid ones that are used to be able to have this platform for children to express those emotions. Yeah, I think it's definitely a broad cultural mm -hmm. thing because like, I, I was in England last summer and and noticing, you know, how people don't express their emotions. And I thought that that's just been handed down. Right. So there's like this this denial mm -hmm. that people they know people get angry. They don't think, oh, anger is caused by fear or hurt. You know, my and my own father was a Marine and um, he fought in Okinawa and you know, hand to hand combat and all of that. So we're driving down the freeway one day and somebody cuts him off and he starts cussing. You know, and I thought, why is he doing that? They can't hear him. <laughs> <laughs> the guy sped off already. You know, and I thought he's angry because that scared him. Mm -hmm. But my dad is not allowed to say, oh, "Wow, that really scared me." So he's gonna act out. You know, mm -hmm. and so it's just part of our culture. Of, you know, many, many, many places around the world. I think it's it's like taboo to talk about your feelings yeah. unless you're being very, you know. Like you said, very stereotypical. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody died, you can cry, or somebody did something, you can be angry. But just on the on the everyday aspect that we have feelings mm -hmm. all the time, and that um, you know, I think my mom would have said, "Well, I don't want you to be a crybaby." Mm -hmm. That was, I was the only girl, so I was the crybaby. You know, so I cried a lot because um, there's something wrong with crying. There's something wrong that you're crying all the time. So she was afraid if she accepted it, that I would be. Um, you know, crying all the time, but mm -hmm. actually, it's the opposite. If you're able to, and then what you do is you give them, you give them the tool. Right. So you say, "This is how you feel." You know, you come into the classroom, you're missing your mom. This is what you can do. Mm -hmm. You can talk about it with somebody. You can draw a picture about it. You know, you can write it, and then pretty soon, you don't you don't have to be there for them. Right. They can do it themselves. You know. Yeah. And then just to hear my kids how they would talk to each other mm -hmm. was almost hysterical. You know, because they would, they would say, "Oh, you know, that hurt my feelings when you did that, or mm -hmm. that, that scared me, or that." I mean, and then the other kid was so in tune right. that it was, it was just wonderful. And you know, it, 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 you prompt, prompt my thought. Um, there's, there's a difference in saying, "I feel this way because of your behavior," versus "You make me feel this way." Mm -hmm. Because you have no control over my emotions. Right, right. I need, and, and it's so interesting on how a lot of children will say that. Well, Kay's making me mad. 
K doesn't control your feelings. Right. Right. But how, again, understanding where children are developmentally, how do how do we have that conversation with them? Well, it's about helping them understand that other people have emotions. It's about helping them understand that they have emotions mm -hmm. and how you properly vent those emotions is the goal that we want to get to. And it's a, it's a big, big shift that I, I really hope that I get to see in, in my life, in my lifespan to be able to have this acceptance of talking about emotions. Again, we're always going to get that cultural clash because we have a very traditional cultures that just see it as weakness. Mm -hmm. um, I, read a book of uh, Tony Parker, the author, he talks about the man box. And in the man box, he talks about the ideologies that society has for men. And one of them is not crying. Because if a, if a, if a man cries, then society makes him the comparison to a girl, which society views girl as weak. Right. So it's detrimental for a man to be compared to a woman just because they're crying. An example that he gave was um, his father apologized to him because he was crying at his other son's funeral. So he had to put his son ah. in the grave and he cried and he apologized to his son, not to his daughters, but to his son. I'm sorry that I cried. Really? Oh, wow. And I remember um, reading that and just thinking like, goodness, like, are we at that point in society where we are going to finally say it's okay to cry. It's okay to grieve. It's, it's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel any emotion as long as you let it out in a healthy way. And the work that you're doing with um, the ELAC um, group, it sounds fascinating because you're teaching future teachers how to allow children to accept those feelings. Um, what has been the response with your colleagues? How, how are they taking uh, this approach? You know, honestly, we're probably more attended to each other because um, now we do like a debriefing, you know, or a, when we when we have meetings, we, we meet a lot. We have a really good relationship. And um, I think that's part of it. We kind of say, how are you feeling today? Yeah, yeah. You know, we kind of tune into that and we're we're able to share, you know, so it's like we're we're acknowledging feelings yeah. Yeah. before you just go into a meeting and you're like. You blah, know, blah, 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 yeah, blah, 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 and now it's like, are you, are you feeling okay, you know, anything going on that, you know, and um, I think we share a lot more mm -hmm. and um, understand each other a lot more, so it, it kind of, it helps everybody. Yeah, helps. hearing you talk about this uh, compassion, hearing you talk about empathy, sympathy, um, reminds me of uh, Father Boyle's work, and we talked about it before we started recording about a homeboy industry, and how... Um, his focus is on giving people a second chance, uh, not condoning anyone's behavior, anyone's choice of behavior, but rather helping them understand that we're not going to define you based on your past mistakes that you kind of grew into, that you had no control over. Mm -hmm. So the example in one of his books, he talks about a, a child that was born into a family that was in gangs. That was in drugs, violence, guns, killings. So eventually this child grows up into thinking that this is the normalized behavior. And then he grows up into just repeating that cycle until he's, um, he's realized, you know, I, I need to change my life. Now you shared a, an example that um, you had. Uh, you want to share with us with that example of, of you were you overheard a conversation? Which one was that? I'm sorry. The, um, about Father oh, Boyle. Oh, from Father Boyle. Yeah. Yeah, I overheard a conversation um, that he was sharing that one of the the, the young men that was mm -hmm. at Father Boyle's um, at Homeboys Industries, I was there and I overheard this conversation. And he was sharing with a, a, a young woman that he was just down and out. He'd been down and out. He, he got out of prison. When he was in prison, he studied um, auto mechanics. So he was really, he got really good at it. And he was excited to come out because he had a skill and he was going to get a good job. And he was just finally had some, you know, some stuff, substance. So he was excited and he got out and no one would hire him. So he went from place to place and he went to this one. And the guy said, well, let me see what you can do. So he gave him a car that was broken or an engine or something and he fixed it. And the guy said, you're really talented. You're really good, but you have a criminal record. I, I just can't hire you. And so he said 
autistic man, I'm going to come back and slit your throat. And so he said, and I meant it. You know? And I was like, well, what? I'm sitting behind this guy. No, no, no. So he said, then I was, you know, I couldn't get a job. I was, he said, I was literally sleeping behind this dumpster across from Homeboys Industries, just sleeping there because I didn't have a home. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a job. And the guys kept saying, go, just go over there, just go over there. So he said, finally, I got, he said it was my pride, just my pride. Mm -hmm. Finally, I just finally walked over, you know, crossed over the door, and he said, Father Boyle saw me personally. He didn't say, oh, here's a counselor. Mm -hmm. here's, he talked to me personally, and he said, he said, tell, he said, tell me your story. But the way he said it was with total respect, mm -hmm. with total empathy with total, I'm not going to judge you. I mean, I, I, it's his manner, you know, it's not even just the words he says, but tell me your story. And the guy told him, and then he said, Father Boyle put his arm on his mm -hmm. shoulder, and he said, son, we can't treat people like that, but I'm going to help you, or whatever he said. Mm -hmm. And the guy said he just burst out in tears, and it, but it totally changed his life. Mm -hmm. It's like he showed him love and acceptance and mm -hmm. So um, went a long way <laughs> to changing his life. Put, putting that putting that in perspective, you have an individual that um, don't know what his childhood was like, but was in, incarcerated, comes out um, in probably an adult. Yeah, he was an adult. He was an adult. So, and just by the fact that he was heard, just by the fact that he was accepted, yes, and not judged made him finally break down, I'm assuming, years of repressed emotions and changed his life into doing something, going a different route. That's, that's deep in the sense of we don't know what children are going through at home. We don't know the life that they, they're living. We don't know until they come into our walls, into our classroom, where we're able to find a way to work with them and talk with them. Now, the approach that you're using allows the children to have a platform to talk about these things. Now, this is not putting the family on blast in any way, but this, right. is, this is a way to talk about how I feel. And think of what it did to an adult. Now, think of how impactful that can be for children. Again, I commend the work that you're doing at East LA College with um, your your group of uh, faculty there. I applaud you guys for using uh, Mr. Rogers' approach. I know it's very beneficial. Um, what, what are your final thoughts for our future teachers that are listening, or current teachers, anyway, in the field that probably is having some form of conflict with injecting social emotional development? You're obviously, you guys are obviously doing a fantastic job. What would be some advice oh, that you can give them? Well, we're trying and we're still learning. But um, but just to really think about it, I think so many times we're, like I said, we're focused on the social. Um, that domain is probably the least dealt with. And mm -hmm. traditionally, schools were all about cognitive. And we're realizing, you know, physical is also important. But just to be tuned into the, the social, emotional, and how much that's going to help the children academically. Mm -hmm. So even though we're in preschool and we're not so worried about, you know, academics, we're setting the foundation. We're setting the foundation. So if they can go go into the classroom, feel accepted and cared about by other individuals outside the family, they're gonna they're gonna like their school experience. Can you imagine going into a school, you know, and being afraid when you're three or four? I mean, you've got how many more years of school that you have to go through this? <laughs> right. So we're the, we're laying the groundwork, we're laying the foundation for their future education and their future relationships with other people. And sometimes we're the first ones to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's just so important, you know, to accept them emotionally. Thank you so much for your time, your Thank experience, you. your knowledge. Really appreciate it. Again, can really, really admire the work that you guys are doing at East LA College. Um, thank you for your time, your expertise. Until next time, everybody. See you at the next. Capture the passion.